You're listening to the Sports Therapy Association podcast. Let's talk about. Okay. <coughs> Welcome. We're going to try again. Just suddenly got cut off by Facebook. So I'm hoping that if you are joining us live, you'll be able to filter through to the um, the new place where we'll be um, streaming to. But anyway, we're here. Episode uh, 74 of the Sports Therapy Association podcast. Um, I'm not sure how many people are going to be able to join us live tonight because uh, for some reason we suddenly went dead again. But we're back. Um, and if you are watching us um, on Facebook, then let other people know we are here live. Um, and also you can watch us on YouTube where we stream live as well. So my name is Matt Phillips. In case you don't know me, I'm creator of Unchat Live. And every Tuesday at eight o'clock, um, then we bring guests from around the world. Um, oh, Brian's here. Good. People are coming in. Hello again, Brian. It looks like we are connected live. Don't worry, guys. It's all going to work. Um, but yes, we bring you guests from around the world to do with the soft tissue therapy industry um, with the common goal of hopefully my goal always is to bring you some evidence informed content and to bring it to you in a way that doesn't kind of make you feel like you have to throw everything out of the uh, pram and that you've actually everything you've done to date has been worthwhile. And all we're going to do is tweak it slightly to bring it up to a modern interpretation of soft tissue therapy. So there we go. Um, like I say, you can join us live um, by joining Facebook Sports Therapy Association page or via YouTube channel. Uh, people are coming in now. If you do join us live, then you are able to cast the, uh, ask the guest questions directly. And also, as you ask, I can bring you up on the screen. Like Catherine Reimer here has said, yeah, it's back on again. It is, isn't it? It's like Netflix went down and suddenly came on again. It's fine, Catherine. Don't worry. Your evening will be complete. Glenn Murphy's in here as well. Um, if you can't join us live, then thank you very much for listening to this. Presumably you're listening to the podcast or maybe you're watching the YouTube feed if you could be so kind as to leave us a nice rating somewhere that'd be great or we'll review particularly on apple Podcasts, because that just helps our good word get out to more people so there you go right i'm it's been three minutes now and i haven't been cut off yet i seem to have quite a good signal so thank you o2 for your mobile hotspot seems to be working okay sorry aaron beard's gone those of you listening to podcast you can't see i'm much less hairy these days it's kind of a my life my wife decision and i kind of went in the middle so anyway right before we start with tonight's uh, episode, I must say thank you again to Raphael Bender um, for last week's excellent hour and um, a Pilates special. Those of you who don't know Rafa's work, he's the principal trainer for Breathe Education based out of Melbourne, Australia, which is why we were an hour later. He kindly joined us at something like six in the morning. Um, um, and Breathe um Education are particularly well known in my books for bringing you, again, evidence based Pilates. It was a fascinating hour looking back at the history of Pilates. And it was really interesting to see how contemporary Pilates, which is probably the most popular form taught these days, is called contemporary, but it kind of came out in the early 2000s alongside Paul Hodge's work. And it took a bit of the science and added it to the current Pilates. And then that's what everyone thinks Pilates is these days. So everyone kind of dismisses Pilates a little bit. I say everyone, like I know everyone, but a lot of people I know kind of dismiss Pilates thinking there's all to do with neutral pelvis and alignment and grabbing your magic circle between your legs and doing all these special moves to try and get um, the multifoodus and the transverse abdominis kind Kind of stimulated that was just one section in a long long history of pilates since the 60s when joseph and his wife carla opened it all up um and um yeah it was really interesting to hear from rafa who's been around for a long time now and um, seeing all the changes in pilates taking us through the history and and basically saying that yeah we can move on we can now evolve we've moved on from what we thought was happening in the early 2000s with regards to the abdominal muscles and all that um, and there's still 99 percent of pilates left in the 60s which has some amazing content um, and he talked us through it in, in, a, in a beautiful way. He's a fantastic educator. So be sure to check out um, Rafa. Breathe Education um, is there. Um, you can see the website, which is actually because it's Australian. It's breathe.edu.au. And also do make sure you check out the Pilates Elephant podcast uh, with co-host Chloe Bunter. Again, anybody who this last week has said, Matt, I get emails sometimes, Matt, what CBD, what do you CBD do you want to, do you think I should do? And this week it's just been fine. You've got, I don't know how many, 50, 60, 70 episodes um, with the Pilates Elephant podcast to get through. And it's valuable, not just for Pilates teachers, it's valuable for anybody who works with people in pain, anybody who's interested in movement, um, anybody who wants to gently but surely update their information. Um, to become a modern, evidence-informed therapist without feeling pressured. 
Now, talking of that, we're going to continue that theme tonight because I have the Massage Collective in the house. And for those of you who aren't aware of the wonderful threesome, we've only got two of them here tonight, but it's it's nearly as good as it could be with all three. Um, we've got the, no, we haven't got the best two actually. Becky's not here, is she? Well, we've got two of them anyway. Um, and um, I'm very excited to bring them up because they, for me, are, well, they still after a year are holding the Olympic torch, burning um, furiously for championing the evolving of our industry. They like that, the Olympic torch. Um, and we're going to be talking to them very shortly. As always, if if you have any questions when you're looking back at the year of massage but as always if you're in the house then do please ask us some questions we'll all be looking out and if you've got something interesting to ask then we will stop what we're doing and we'll talk to you okay right then so without further ado just making sure everything's okay i'll bring up in no particular order um two-thirds of the massage collective anna maria mazzieri and matt scarsbrook how are you people good evening, good evening. I, I, oh, I, I think my microphone has just gone off. Can no, you I can hear, hear me? Oh, I fantastic. Can, I can hear what sounds like vegetable kind of steaming in the background. I'm not sure who that's coming from. <laughs> I might see if I meet you one by one. It's not Anna. Let's just try Matt. It's not Matt. Oh, can you hear a hissing at all? Is it just me? Yeah, no, I can hear a hissing. And also my camera seems to be really blurry. Can you hear a hissing in the house? I, someone, can, uh, I cannot. Huh? Oh, well, it's going to be interesting me with Audacity trying to edit that out on the final product, but we'll see if it calms down eventually. We never know. All right, guys, thanks for joining us. First of all, where is the we can hear? Can you hear a hissing in the background, Stephen? I'm just getting some comments from people who have joined us live. Yes, you can. Is it bearable? I've tried muting people. What about if I mute me? Mm. at least they're not my dogs i promise it's not your dogs hissing away yeah. okay you can see yeah. in here so, all right sir well i hope you can hear us okay um evening on here oh, that's right they're not yeah. complaining so it should be okay right so first of all where's the other third of the massage collective uh well she's she's just jumped in into the chat she's uh currently on the train in the middle of nowhere um no ah, she's, she's, at the moment she's, she's taken um uh a short what's the word hiatus I think from the podcast, uh, she's got a load of um, other projects that she's working on for us in the background. So, um, so uh, at which it, at the moment involves a being on a train in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> oh, Becky, well, I'm sorry you couldn't make it with us tonight, but um, I'm sure you're doing far better, more productive things. Um, but hey, another time we'll um, hopefully wait to speak to you, Becky. But good luck on your train to the middle of nowhere. <laughs> there we go. Um, stay with us while you can. So anyway, right. Um, kind of happy birthday to you guys i don't think we were talking off air and you don't really realize it's been about a year since you first kind of graced us with your presence and took over the internet yeah that's a bit weird <laughs> um I, that seems to i think you know in a sense we kicked off at a point that the industry seemed to be slightly in chaos anyway because of covid and then the birthday seems to have gone past for the same reasons because actually you know we're kind of all trying to get back to some sort of normality normality didn't even realize until you pointed it out <laughs> <laughs> that's just kind of the guys you are isn't it? you just go forward you've got a mission you don't even realize what how time is affecting you well it has been a year so i thought uh, thanks for joining us because i thought it'd be interesting through you and the progression of um, massage collective to track how far we've got in the year in terms of affecting the industry and you guys have obviously been working hard and you've had some great chances to talk to the masses <coughs> but see so, yeah how we are it's not quite christmas said yet like i saw it said in the advert but it's nearly kind of the beginning of a new year so um so yeah so what i've done actually done um is i've gone to your fantastic facebook page nice new logo by the way i can't remember what my like it was it? but it's very nice it's yeah cool, great massaging it? itself beautiful yeah. Yeah, we've got that Be no, becky you can admit it, it was becky wasn't it the brain's <laughs> behind the operation um but yeah so um we're going to go back through your facebook page what i have and just hit some points that you mentioned and see whether they're still relevant now whether things have changed since you first did it and have a look does that make sense is that okay yeah absolutely i'm sure we get Lovely. loads of interesting conversation out of it okay right so um yeah it was june 2020 28th that's your first wow. post um over a year ago now well at least on on the massage collective facebook page and the first post basically said in big capital letters with a little picture behind it it's all about the nerves and that's kind of what you guys have been saying for the year do you think that is now less of a shock to people than it was a year or first of all a year ago do you think that was news to a lot of people and now a year later do you think it's less news to people uh it's a difficult one isn't it 
I think the message was out there, but the people were very isolated. So they didn't feel connected and they didn't have the opportunity to speak to those others that uh, they, they, they were following the same pathway. But what this, this year had given us, the, the, the great positives that put us all together. Now we are becoming a community, a, a movement, and, and this reinforced and validated what was already actually happening into the industry. Just being on social media all the time, it just exposed it. So do you think there's other people around here with the same message, but the message just wasn't getting through a year ago? Yes, I do think, yes. I've been in the it's industry really for a while. I do think, I think the message is, was there. The message was underground. The message, uh, you know, there were some good tutors out there. There were some good schools out there doing the, uh, doing the work. But now they brought it all together. And, those, and there was also the, the beauty of it. There was those people that were starting already things not making sense within the practice because they've been in practice for a while and they're thinking, I'm not really sure that that really makes sense as I was taught. And then all of a sudden, somebody can express it with the words on social media much better than they, they make sense, you know, they can make sense to them. And all of a sudden they thought, oh yes, now I understand. So it's been tremendously, tremendously positive. So do more people, I think people are less shocked. And I think the more the, the, is grown dramatically, something that was already there. I think we were ready for it. I mean, in terms of, I think, yeah, I think it's, it's probably a, a case of <clears throat> after a while, with any new idea, you start to get enough mass rolling behind it uh, that it becomes kind of less shocking because more people are kind of at least alluding to it. I mean, I, this weekend just gone was the first weekend um, I've been back in the classroom teaching, um, which is which has been awesome. And going through and, and, and making sure that the, the, the presentation and materials were kind of up to date and relevant, et cetera, et cetera, before, before teaching. Um, <clears throat> there's a slide in there now, despite the fact that we update our slides, obviously, every time we teach them, there's still a slide in there uh, from when I originally trained, which pretty much says it's all about the nerves. Um, but there's also a quote in there that we use um, from Eric Purvis that is dated 2013? 2016. 2016. <clears throat> there we go. Even I can't remember. But I mean, we're talking now, what, seven, five, six years ago? um you know about to be 2020 and and back then it was definitely a bit more shocking uh, mm. whereas you know the the fact that we get the opportunity to regurgitate some of this great stuff this this thinking that was happening before and of course eric Burvis is still doing a huge amount in that area for us um and because people were kind of yes connected to their screens a lot more i think it's just there's been a few things that have come together that has has made it a easier to be more positive around it three of those things came together it was Anne maria mazzieri and matt scarsbrook and becky Hart horton i think <laughs> you're not giving yourselves credit for the fact that youth guys came along people kind of already knew you separately probably and i mean obviously for the school and everything and the great work you've done there and matt you'd been you know a guests in a few podcasts and creating quite a few ways on, on a different media and your name was getting up there and people were already talking about, well, oh, that Scars book's really keen. He likes his stuff, doesn't he? So you were already there, which was exciting. And then Becky came along, who was this wonderful, how do I say this without her being here? And not, she was almost like a girl next door who suddenly people could relate to because she wasn't like, look at me, I know everything. It was like, actually, I was like that. And I remember the first podcast you guys did and you could see those nerves in her voice. And yet, I think you'd agree, when we had a chat about it after, she came mm. through as just sort of the, wow, this is somebody we need in our threesome here because she's someone everyone can relate to. And it was it was just a magic coming together for you three. So I think um, I'll start in the beginning by saying, well done, it's great. You guys have really contributed towards just attracting the average therapist to not, feeling kind of pressurized and scared because the way you present the information so thank you for that you guys <laughs> was that your intention did you think that up to date the information's been a bit scary and we've got to do something about that yes this is was what our our aim was we realized that there were those people out there that they wanted to know more but they actually they didn't know how to navigate into um navigate into this 
you know, uh, a massive amount, amount of information, especially at the, say, at the time where, you know, some of the information was quite contradictory to what they, they were taught, to the, what they knew, the, what they were practicing. And that can be quite scary. And what we wanted to provide was a safe space to learn together. I think, I think also, I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that is pretty much precisely what we wrote down on, on the piece of paper when we kind of all got together and go, well, what, what are we trying to get out of this? Because, of course, you know, if you're setting up any project, you need a, a form, a goal or something just to make sure that you're staying on, on course, right? And, and one of the bits, particularly for me, all right, I come from an academic background originally, and I still play in academia now, but I trained to become a soft tissue therapist vocationally. And once I entered the kind of uh, complementary healthcare slash healthcare world, it became quite obvious quite quickly. There was um, a real kind of turning the nose up <laughs> of uh, the academic kind of therapist to vocationally trained therapists. And there's this idea that, you know, vocational was in some way lesser. And having come through it myself, I... Uh, I was absolutely adamant, as Anna has been all the way through, but I was absolutely adamant that, that vocational training was not about lower quality of knowledge or lower quality of understanding. It was more about learning in a way that fit the lifestyle of the individual at the time. You know, not all of us can afford to go back and do three years of university at the drop of a hat with mortgages, kids, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So vocational learning can be more accessible for individuals but that doesn't mean that the content should be any less quality it might mean that it's it's uh you know you get to the same end point but from a slightly different route maybe because people might not have the same uh academic experience coming into it but that doesn't mean the quality should be any less and and that's 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 sort of what's guided us we've wanted to make sure that people have access to the effectively to the academia, which is really important. We're at the end of the day, we're working with people in health care. You know, we can affect people's pain from what we say. And, 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 and it's really important we get that right. But it needs to be delivered in such a way that is accessible, because otherwise it's a waste of time. <laughs> Definitely. Listen, I'm just thinking, I'm thinking off the spot now because I haven't really planned anything particular. I've got a, I've got the trace of your Facebook page to give me some cues, but I'm just feeding off what you're saying now. So this might surprise you, some of these questions. Right, you ready? You've got a 30-second elevator pitch to a therapist who is still working on their kind of slightly outdated traditional approach to massage, still believe that they're kind of getting rid of knots, still believe that... Um, they're, they're helping circulation, all stuff that's still put out there, unfortunately, on level three, and level four courses, even. You've got a 30 second elevator pitch without scaring the hell out of them. Who should I pick on first? Because you can both, you might, it might differ. Anna Maria, oh, looking down there, playing yeah, with something like, oh, don't I, ask I, me. Don't look at me. I got, I got my dog. I, uh, my <laughs> that was head such head a classroom response. If you think our teacher can't see you, then they won't ask you. Yeah. Yes, I do. Right. <laughs> yes. I hear it's like that. Oh, oh don't ask me. <laughs> right, 30 seconds in a lift. To somebody who's like gone in the lift with you, how would you say it to them without scaring them? Because I think that's one of the biggest problems. What would you say to them? What, what, hmm, ah, oh God, this is difficult. I hate to do this elevator pitch. I know, I'm just putting you straight uh, on the spot. So what, what we do, what we do, all of us, uh, has got tremen tremendous values. The benefit of what we do is not, you know, we're not discussing the benefit because we know people feel better coming for treatment. We help them feel in improved range of motion. We give them uh, the reassurance they can do that, that the movement. Uh, we help them with the pain. Why all those uh, benefits happen? We need to rethink that because evidence in the last uh, few decades is guiding us to it's guiding us to something a little bit different than what we thought because the human being is complex and actually evidence is showing that we are more complex than the linear um than the linear explanation that we used to have so very nice that's your 30 seconds that's your 30 seconds i'm afraid lifts arrived at floor 10 and they're out <laughs> Very nice. No, I like it. Um, I like the way you started off with the positives. That's really important. That's great. Matt, same question to you. 30 seconds. Ding. So I was Matt, just, aren't you? Wow. 
I was desperately trying to uh, grab a slide so I can use my slide as my 30 seconds. And unfortunately, it turns out that even Anna's 30 seconds, which is usually 90 uh, as a minimum, isn't quite long enough for me to manage. Um, so I, uh, I would go that the therapeutic touch um, is getting more attention than ever before because therapeutic touch is the component that makes the biggest difference or, or from a hands-on perspective um you know i think i would start i would say look the the bits that are most possible are most positive are, are the, the biggest wins from what we do already are that we provide therapeutic touch that is not provided in other forms of healthcare all right yeah private healthcare perhaps but but certainly not in public healthcare um that uh we get to spend time with our clients and we get to uh, they get time to express their story and that those are the three most important things when it comes to being a high quality massage therapist as far as i'm concerned now that would terrify someone perhaps who would go well what about when i'm doing with the knots what about when i'm working with this and and i would essentially say well if you know <clears throat> how do your muscles work what makes a muscle tense up you know it doesn't just happen spontaneously the nervous system is involved in causing that muscle to tense up well if a muscle comes into you attached to a body uh and it feels particularly tense then if we're interacting with the nervous system in a nice calm lovely way then we can reduce that tension in the muscle why do we need any, nice. why do we need a nice size than that? ding oh, it's unfair if i give you more time than that beautiful yeah so i kind of sorry to put you on the spot like that both of you but i love the way that both of you start off with the positivity of massage and that's something that's why i did it really because i knew you were both going to do that and that's so important isn't it because a lot of the stuff put on social media these days just starts off with a negative it's not this what do you think it's that and it's some kind of funny meme saying oh do you think you do this when you're massaging well it's not ha 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 but um both of you guys i think that's a common theme with the massage collective i don't know whether you decided it when it started is yes hold on before yeah. we do anything it's classic this is great what we do there's no doubt we're not talking about the benefits we know it works we're just talking about how it works and uh, yeah and i like your metaphors matt because and the ideas about uh, sorry matt but you know the way we talk to our colleagues and therapists, the way we would talk to our clients, we don't, we don't shame our clients because of their updated beliefs on pain. Therefore, we certainly don't want to make our colleagues, um, you know, feel outdated or feel feel bad. So let, let's talk to our colleagues as as we talk to our to our clients and i think i think that that has been that has been a challenge you know i'll hold my hands up and say that has been a challenge because of the limitations of social media um you know be, it's one of the reasons why the podcast is so is such a helpful tool for us in in trying to achieve what we you know we've set out to try and do because actually just communicating through uh through any form of social media otherwise is is very directive um, I was having this conversation over the weekend, funnily enough, with, um, with my sister-in-law, um, and and you know we used, she she was using the analogy that you know when you're talking on social media, uh, or when you're having a, any conversation, any conversation, you you fundamentally you take the role of one of three people. You're either an adult, and an adult to adult conversation is respectful, it's progressive, uh, but it's based off being able to read the cues of the other person. Yeah, much easier in person not as easy but okay over camera impossible on social media uh, the other two roles are the parent which is very directive i'm telling you this this is how life is uh and then you have the child which is as you might imagine it's kind of very uh petulant or or or, or dismissive or or very you know not constructive and 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 conversations on social media almost by definition can't be adults to adults because you can't there isn't tone we know that but you can't read the reaction you can't tell if someone's got tongue in cheek or whether the smiley face is sarcastic or any of that and you end up with either parent to parent conversations where i tell you something you tell me something and we never really get anywhere or, or people respond in such a way that the only response becomes childish if if i can use that that, that, that term um because there isn't an opportunity to go Whoa, oh actually okay it appears i overstepped the line there let me rephrase that and, th and then you end up just going down a rabbit hole and 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 that is really difficult 
um, when when trying to spread new ideas. And I think you know that that that's never been any more clear than probably the last few years. Certainly the last presidential uh, rubbish and all that kind of stuff. You know, it, we, we end up just transactional analysis. There we go. I knew John was going to know what I was talking about. Um, uh, yeah, it becomes it becomes that, that and 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 that's been that's really challenging, which is why I think it's so valuable to be able to have mediums where we can spread information, but it can be done in such a way that we can still retain an element of that kind of adult to adult conversation. Um, because Excellent. otherwise, yeah, we just get a brick wall. Um, thanks, John, for clearing that up. PAT, transactional analysis. Matt, big thumbs up. Uh, don't forget, there's some questions coming through, which I will come to. A couple of you asked questions, um, but I will address them in a sec. I just want to ask him something else. On the delivery, how much of a difference do you think it makes? Because I think it's quite important and um, within the context of social media. Um, teaming up with Jack Chu and co and being Massage Matters, that was quite a big thing because that was suddenly traditional physio base suddenly working with a massage outfit to produce a body of work, which I think was quite a unification and kind of prompted mm. quite a lot of dialogue between key players who wouldn't have normally have talked to each other. Um, talk to me through how that came about and, um, and yeah, and how it's helped. T to be perfectly honest, um, Jack was probably actually the instigator. Um, so I at the time thought I must have suddenly woken up dreaming and I'd reached the pinnacle of my career when Jack gives me a call out of the blue and goes, I'm setting up something called Therapy Live. Do you fancy helping? And I was like, oh, my God, it's Jack Chu. <laughs> um, I've since met the fella and I'm less overwhelmed. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, slightly less. <laughs> but but he, he sort of kickstarted that. You know what? You and your colleagues are talking sensible things around around manual therapy that I can get behind. Um, and can I can I help you? Can I give you a platform? Effectively was 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 where it came from. Um, and that evolved into uh, well, how about you know you have a podcast called Massage Matters, and uh, Anna, Becky, and I basically um, you know because I rang uh, basically Anna and Becky and went, I'm not doing this on my own. Um, so uh, asked um, asked them to come on board, and we sat there and well, what can we be? Because we don't want to be just in the nicest possible way. We don't want to be just another facet of Physio Matters. We want to be able to do our own thing. We want to be able to to, to produce our own um, content in such a way that appeals to the therapists we most need to speak to and who are probably put off by content such as elements of uh, you know physiotherapy produced stuff. Um, and so that's where the, the Massage Collective came from. Uh, this idea that actually we can be a collective as a three, but really it, we're a collective as an industry um, and, and we want to progress the industry together, um, together. Yeah, and, and, together. and it is a together. Mm -hmm together thing and so that, that's kind of how it came about so you know huge thanks uh, are due to, to jack for i suppose even coming across us and, and listening to us and deciding actually we were talking some something he could get behind which is which is a, a lovely um kind of piece of recognition and then and then for sticking with us while we <laughs> learned how to not make complaints. and for him for him he always says it he always says it. you know it he kind of uh we gave him a view of soft tissue therapy or manual therapy, which was a sensible view. And uh, because sometimes we can be in our own ego chambers and we think that, you know, everybody, you know, everybody outside those eco chambers are, are, are not following good practice. But actually, we gave him a view that there can be a sensible approach to manual therapy and we provide a sensible approach to manual therapy and it should not be a dichotomy. And, uh, and the relationship has become stronger and stronger. And actually, I think we, we really uh, kind of interplay uh, our relationship. It's, it's a lovely interplay between, between all of us, for sure. I mean, opportunities, for example, like to sit down and ask Adam Meekins why he doesn't like being massaged at Therapy Live. Mm. That's an opportunity that was never going to come along otherwise. <laughs> It's very true. And I was going to mention that. I mean, it is important, I think. And Jack was, was again, a great influencer in helping, which is his massive desire, the forwarding of healthcare, regardless of profession and what you do and all that. He's, he's from the very beginning 
well not from the very beginning because physio matters podcast essentially set out as physios but by meeting so many different guests and starting to see different um, professionals and different breaking you know, down the boundaries and he's realized hold on we need to be working together a bit more isn't it yeah so um yeah great stuff well done jack well done jack um but yeah but then for example adam meekins is a is a classic example of somebody who normally people because of what they see on social media would think he'd never ever even talk to somebody who who kind of preaches about the benefits of massage and he still goes on these days if you don't look between the lines at slagging it off and kind of criticizing and putting all these things in then he goes and gets himself injured but anyway but it's 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 yeah on when was it december the 10th you um yeah had a um yeah we had DJ both ben, ben and in ben cormack that's fantastic yeah. so kind of it's the it's the biopsychosocial thing which brought everyone together the same way as we try to bring together the biology and the psychology and the sociology that has also brought together different professions if you're on that page realizing the influence that all those three factors have you can all suddenly talk together can't you it's when you start ignoring and so yeah um did it all go well did you reckon you made some ground did you give adam a massage or did it not quite happen <laughs> I, know. I keep telling him. I keep telling him. It was. There was. I can't remember who it was now. One of the uh, Physio Matters team did try and uh, start a. Um, if we can raise ten grand for charity, will Adam uh, get a massage from Matt? I think he died a very quick death on Twitter. Thanks to Adam. Um, but I think. I think this is. I mean, he's a great example, actually, um, of someone who acknowledges. I think the limitations of social media has a persona on social media that is just in, in, you know, intentionally set up to deal with the limitations. And he knows that, you know, essentially whenever you post something on social media, because of these limitations, you're going to achieve one of two things. You're either going to get sort of the sycophantic, oh, that's brilliant. That's wonderful. I'm agreeing with you entirely. You confirm my biases, or you're going to go, you're wrong. And everything that comes from that, there's, there isn't really room for discussion. And I think Adam has, has embraced that and has gone, you know what? my social media personality is going to be that because actually when you talk to him either one-to-one -one or as a, you know, as a, as a, as a kind of behind the scenes natter, or even to be honest, when, you know, the, the occasions I've been lucky enough to moderate him on, on these, on these things or have a direct conversation with him, he's a, he's a different character. He is, mm -hmm. dare I say, more level. <laughs> he acknowledges his biases. He doesn't like physical touch particularly he's not the kind of guy who you're going to walk up and hug and come away without a black eye i, <laughs> I did um, i did the first th no, the second you? therapy expo i saw him and it was really weird because it was like second therapy expo all in manchester i never forget this actually you just brought it back but it was like i'd spent a year or two maybe two or three years following or talking to jack and talking to mike stewart and all these kind of people um and uh who else was there in griffiths and Seth O'Neill, and of course Adam Meekins was there as well in the early days of Twitter. And then suddenly I turned around, and he was kind of there in his tweed jacket and his elbow pads, and I just kind of went, tweed I just jacket. gave him a hug. Adam yeah, yeah, of course he was wearing a tweed jacket. jacket. Yeah, 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 setting the setting, the uh, so, yeah, the scene. But yeah, I kind of um, for some reason because I'd followed him so much for a couple of years, he was very much one of the kind of instigators of schools of thought and stuff. And he was kind of provoking people, which was kind of good at the time. You know, I remember kind of saying, "I don't know whether to give you a hug or to hit you." I said because he was annoying me in so many ways in some respects with the stuff. I, was coming I out just wish. Blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But other times I wanted to embrace him. So that's what yeah, was, that was the first I, words I, I said to Adam Meekins in person. Yeah, I, I wish and I had discussions so many times in so different groups about about Adams and his posts. And I, I am a big fan of Adam. I am a very big fan because I think as a practitioner, he's a good practitioner. And I learned a lot clinically from uh, his exchanges, from his talks uh, and everything. I just wish we had more critical thinkers reading post and just reading beyond that manual therapy sucks, beyond mm. that, uh, you know, uh, oh, you know, no hands on and so on. Because actually, there is a lot that we can learn from Adam, and we should, uh, you know, it, it doesn't bother me. I mean, some exchange message says to me, says, "Oh, go and put your warm towels on the radiator." Yes, of course I will, because actually, <laughs> it's quite nice to make my client feel good, and you know, it doesn't we bother should... me because I'm so secure. I am so secure on my position within the industry, within the healthcare, within um, my profession, that whatever he says about me and my hands-on, I don't care, but I learn 
so much from him because I think he's a very good practitioner and he's an excellent educator. Yeah, we actually took a lot of stick uh, for, for her hosting, hosting him. Yeah, um, uh, and yeah. and and it's that's yeah. that was frustrating because we were sort of sitting there going, but but can't you see past it? And I, and I think and again I think this speaks to a lot. I'm going to move off social media in a minute, I promise. Um, but it speaks to a lot about these these kinds of interactions and and the fact that you know we were hosting Adam and the fact that we will continue to host people who challenge us is because I suppose we embrace challenge because it helps us become more confident in what we do and why we do it. It's a bit like the scientific progress, the process. You 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 accept challenge you look at that challenge objectively and if it stands up then you reassess your theories and if it doesn't then you can become a bit more confident that you're on the right track and as it stands therapeutic touch has yet to be properly challenged in any particular mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. the mechanisms we used to set, we used to speak about yeah they've been challenged they've they've they've, mm -hmm. they've uh, made, helped us move forward but the problem with challenges and particularly in the social media forum is I think it breeds fear in a lot of people. And I think a lot of the conversations end up spiraling the way they do out of fear. And I think trying to help uh, reduce some of that fear is, is beca it's becoming clearer. That's kind of part of what we're trying to do uh, as, as we started acknowledging that. And I think the stick that we got for having Adam come and, and speak on a manual therapy, you know, CPD was people were, scared i think about what he might say that might challenge them that they might not have a, a good enough comeback for. um whereas actually yeah you know, no, great if points. We can take if we can take that challenge for people and turn it around and, and regurgitate it in such a way that we can we can reconceptualize it reconceptualize yeah. it that's as simple I as think that that's the thing once you've got the bps framework kind of behind you that's a pretty strong kind of thing to defend anything we do on it's very useful but if you are trying to defend what you do with outdated principles like well no i'm using this roller or massage gun because it really helps get in there and break down well you are going to fall flat on your face and you and you're going to get angry because people are going to push you easily into a corner so so to people listening yeah um you know you by updating mechanisms of action some people say oh it's not important how it happens but it kind of is because uh, if you yes, do want to talk is. about it and learn you need to kind of have a better idea and be less wrong like we said a few times because well, then you can talk to other therapists and defend it uh, well not only for dama to me it, it is very important because uh, damage can be done with our words so yes the client might mm, feel much better true. much better after coming to you for treatment because you might have told them that the SI joint is stuck or whatever yeah they, of course they, they will feel better because of different non-contextual effect but actually on the long term what damage would you have done to that self-efficacy of the person on the effect what what would you have done to that person for the next occurrence of back pain so um, no it's that's that's why it's important we change our narrative to me it's not you know you want to work in pay with people in pain you want to work with people with injury you have to follow evidence informed practice for me there is not a choice it's, it's and this, and, yeah and that that's that's a point that i've i've brought up with anna several times because i can't remember what it was it was months ago anna you just almost casually dropped into i can't remember if it's a podcast or just a conversation we were having but we were talking about the industry in general and, and sort of you know trying to go well where where might it go what might it look like what what could we end up in? and I th what it boiled down to and i put it so simply at the time was well essentially you you either work in 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 leisure or you work in healthcare uh, and 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 there are different requirements on the professionals that work in, in either. But if you are choosing to work in healthcare, and that is anyone presenting with pain and injury, because of the risks uh, that we now understand around the poor narratives, nocebo effects, um, possibly delaying mainstream treatment as a result of poor narratives as well, then, then actually perhaps what we should be saying as an industry is there is a distinct difference. And if you are working in the healthcare side, 
we're not healthcare professionals. We're not saying that. But if if we are complementary to mainstream healthcare and therefore dealing with pain and injury, then actually there comes a, re a professional responsibility to be up to date, to work with evidence based practice. Now, I mean, sorry, I, can, can I? I'm going to wrap up this point. I promise. Yeah, this, yeah that's fine. To, this leads onto something else that we're really really excited about and 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 i suppose looking forward into 2022 if we come to that bit is is people might might not be aware but but within evidence-based medicine within evidence-based practice the randomized controlled trial has always been held up as the gold standard and one of the bits that really sort of upsets massage therapists and is used as ammunition against massage therapists is that massage does not stand up well in a, in a randomized controlled trial, partly because it's massively impractical to set up a randomized controlled trial, but also it just doesn't seem to do what we thought it did. You know, if we're measuring, uh, I don't know, scar tissue formation, for an example, and we're using massage as one of the, the factors, it doesn't seem to do what we think. And so that makes people upset. And, and then, and then we kind of go, oh, well, you know, science isn't everything. Science hasn't caught up yet and all that kind of malarkey. Now, what's really, really cool is that actually the elements of the um, sort of research establishment are starting to realize that if you run a randomized control trial, which by definition removes all complexity from the, from the model and just leaves us with two factors, and then try and apply the results of that to the human, who is by definition mentally complex, like insanely complex, then we're probably not even, the RCT probably isn't as useful as you used to think. And so there's a, a, a movement towards trying to bring in or at least balance other methodologies alongside the RCT. Remove the RCT from its perch. It's so important still. It's so, so important. But put it more in a level playing field with other modalities of research. And that that's led to um, or being led by Cause Health, uh, which is an outfit um, predominantly out of Norway, I guess, but it's Norway, involved, Southampton, yeah. Norway and Southampton, Southampton, and it's involved some basically philosophers, leading physiotherapists, leading doctors um, that basically is saying we need when we're dealing with the human and particularly the health of the human and pain in particular. We perhaps need to have a wider range of scientific uh, investigations at our fingers that we can rely on. What they are not saying is evidence-based practice is out the window yeah. and it's still so important to have the evidence base but what they are saying is we need to take a bit more of a what i would call holistic approach and also what they say which i really like one of them um uh, she said we research needs to be informed more by clinicians those clinicians mm -hmm. needs to be informing the the questions that needs to be asked in research and as well as clinician needs to be informed themselves a little bit more by the researchers but clinicians needs to be part of the research process and the, and the bit that really again i get re really passionate when i talk about this stuff is at the, the extreme end of evidence-based medicine <clears throat> excuse me you've got someone who will apply a treatment and to an individual and keep applying it until it either works or they declare that individual non-responsive. At the far end of the complementary health spectrum, we've got true holistic thinking, but the holistic approach, the holistic thinking, the, the application of treatments or methods or narrative are based on fairy dust and magic. In the middle is where cause health and what's known as dispositionalism seems to be trying to bring us, which is we have to understand the complexity of the human and the environment in which that individual exists and the reality within it, whilst also having, well, what does basic science tell us? Let's get rid of the fairy dust. And what excites me is that I think it's easier to bring scientific understanding to a holistic mindset than it is to bring a holistic mindset to a scientist. And so I think that puts complementary therapy, massage therapy in particular, in an incredibly strong position moving forward 
if we can overcome the barriers of fear and resistance about letting go of some some bad ideas because what we're not saying is you need to add anything particularly we just need to say you need to let go okay. whereas the scientists they need to start adding stuff <laughs> yeah they need to start actually understanding that that this human needs time to express Very interesting I like that yeah um and 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 so you know uh, as i say oh, looking yeah. forward mm -hmm. that's that's what excites me <clears throat> Very good. And you think that by following these people, things are, are going to be exciting kind of once we get into 2022? This is going to show itself, or at least we're moving in the right direction. We're starting to move in the right direction, yeah. I mean, nothing's, nothing's fast in this world, um, particularly not when it comes to trying to change the views around well, what makes scientific gold standards. But the fact that the conversations are happening is... You know, hugely better than mm -hmm. we were five years ago. I've always kind of when I when I've got students and frozen a bit of their mat, or maybe I've frozen. I've, I'm always kind of encouraging students to to because, like you say, clinicians should form a much bigger part of research, but they shouldn't just be testing at the end of a session and measuring whether the legs are the same length. They're measuring the wrong things, and they should also be noting down when things aren't actually what they thought it should be, and, and not just forgetting about them and pushing yeah. them under the carpet. But if we did have a large clinician base who who did actually start adding to research and some massive big Excel chart somewhere about what happened after they did apply a certain treatment and, and taking everybody into account and having that huge sample population and then starting to look at that data instead of something under, like you say, a, a totally unnormal, not treating a human being like a human being kind of, uh, you know, randomized control trial. We could offer a fantastic kind of insight into what is happening over a long time in, in different clinics over the world. It'd be, I don't know whether anything like that happens now, but you know, it could, it could happen. I think um, it would be interesting, but yeah, we've got to, first of all, yeah. Stop the fear of, of letting things go. I like that. How you put that. Um, holistics have to let go of some things, but then the scientists the other have to kind of add some stuff nicely done um look i've got a question here for the big dp david clark porter Yay. is in the house um it was a while ago asked i think we've kind of touched on it already but um david said human touch is essential let's put it up on the screen for those of you who are watching on youtube human touch is essential how do you separate the contextual effects of touch from any active effect effect well, effect well or don't you care uh, so, so uh, actually <clears throat> you know matt when you were saying before our first podcast was it's all about the nerves so. And I still go slide there in my first, in the first uh, PowerPoint for the, it's all about the nerves. Actually, it's not all about the nerves. It's too specific. So mm. picking up on your point today, David, nice, nice to see you here, by the way, uh, is you cannot really separate non, -con you know, those, those contextual effect, non-specific effect. We do we care or don't we care? Yes, it would be it would be nice, but you cannot really separate them. We know we know there is there is some evidence that you know touch you know touch per se has those neurological effects, and then we put it together with the psychological um, evidence telling us about about for example therapeutic alliance and uh, communication and put it together and we can you know that's why our treatment are quite special because we can put the two together so but yes it's very difficult to so when when on our first podcast we said oh it's all about the nerves that is a little bit too specific and i think actually the specificity of the nerve the, the, the neurological input i think is smaller than the non-specific big effect of therapy. I think that, of course, the neurocentric effects are there, but I, my understanding is it's much smaller than those bigger non-context, or those contextual effects or non-specific effects. So yeah, thank you for a great question, David. For people who are watching who aren't quite sure what we mean by contextual effects, Matt, could you kind of summarize what David yeah. is referring to there? So <clears throat> contextual effects are essentially we're referring to the environment in which touch is taking place. So the, um, the really simplistic analogy I give here, and actually funny, I'm, I'm, I'm studying with Mick Thacker at the moment. I'm doing a, a, a module in, um, uh, well, pain from a, a predictive processing perspective, which is in, incredible and it's, it's blowing my mind. 
partly because of the level of detail we go into. And one of the things that he's really hot on is not oversimplifying things to the level of irrelevance. And so I am so careful now with the analogies I use, but by definition, we've got to start somewhere. So the really simplistic analogy that I use when I'm talking about this kind of thing with clients or, or maybe, you know, new students is I could give you, I could provide some touch to your body to get rid of a trigger point. Okay. And most people would be aware that, you know, that trigger point type work is likely to be a little bit sore, like a little bit painful. The outcome from that treatment is likely to be different. If I treated you in a lovely room with nice smells, it's warm, it's lovely lit, we've talked beforehand, you know what's going to happen and you come out afterwards, to if I performed it in a dungeon with manacles, people hanging from them, and me with some sort of, you know, executioner's mask on. The touch might be the same. But the outcome and your perception of it at the time is likely to be very, very different. And so that's simplistically what we mean when we're talking contextual effects. So it is the conversation you've had with your therapist. It's the words your therapist might have used to describe what's going on, whether they're talking, oh, yeah, you know, your, your, your hips slipped. And so that's why this muscle's out of place. And that's why it's really sore here or something like that. It, it's the environment in which it takes place in, in terms of the temperature of the room, the how relaxed you are because you like the music or actually whale music sends you to sleep and you'd rather something a little bit more upbeat. It, it, it's that kind of stuff. It's everything that goes around the outside. It's interesting, though, because people kind of talk about contextual effect. It's nice to move on from placebo effects. That's what probably a lot of people listening have regarded it as so placebo effect like oh it's because you're wearing a white coat and they think that you're a doctor it's going to get better and that's placebo effect but it's not placebo because placebo by definition does nothing so we don't call it placebo anymore we call it contextual so but still people tend to use that as a negative thing like saying oh yes but you're saying it works but you've got the contextual effect but I, I more and more don't see it that way. Contextual effect is always there. It's part of the treatment, and that's why it's important. And I remember actually now you bring up Mick Thacker. I think years ago, he was one of the guys who just blew my mind when we were debate. Well, there was a Twitter conversation going on about the dangers of of looking at the human body in a kind of a dualistic way of the brain against the body. I think it's called mirological fallacy or something he came up with. And of course, I was Googling mirological fallacy. What the hell is that? It was this Mick Thacker guy. But it was, it was, he was kind of talking about how the effect that it's not just the brain and the body at all, it's our environment around us that makes us. And it's huge, a huge part of this is what's around us, not actually what's inside us. And for me, contextual effect is the same as that. All our personalities and the way we think and what we do is depends on what's around us. And we change as people depending on where we are, how we act if we're in a police station compared to how we act if we're down the pub or something. It's like, and let's so I don't see why it's seen as a bad thing. Yeah, we should use contextual yeah, effect yeah, as much yeah, as we yeah. can. Yeah. You, can't, you can't remove, you cannot treat anyone without a context. It's yeah. as simple as that. That person lives in a context and you are part of that. And when they come into the treatment room, but it's you also, probably can, but they call it an RCT. No, they call it an RCT. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. fair that's what it is, isn't it? Take out all the context, and that's the limitation of an RCT because you're kind of taking that out normally. So. That's why, you know, for me, I think <clears throat> even over the last 12 months, my stance, my personal stance has softened on what we might call different modalities because actually the modalities, I, you know, I used to be like, why would you stick needles in people? Why would you use cupping? Why would you use tools? Because of the narrative that went with them. Whereas now, because I'm, you know, comfortable that actually there is a narrative that supports them and part of that narrative is the context the contextual effects under which those uh those modalities are used and the fact that the individual the, the individual therapist is part of the context is what makes me feel much more comfortable when a client doesn't come back to me because you know yeah. what if if i cannot strike up a therapeutic alliance with that client because we just don't match then it's better for the client to go to someone who they can do that with. And, and understanding that I am part of that, co that contextual effect makes me feel much more secure in what I do and why I do it, um, which is quite nice as well. <laughs> Definitely. No, it's nice to hear you. I mean, I'm kind of on the same kind of train. Yeah. I mean, it, but it's how you use it. It's, that's the problem. It's the dialogue that goes with it, isn't it? It's like, and where we were saying, it's the words you use. If you're sticking needles into people and saying these needles are affecting this meridian, it's going to link your big toe to your liver. It's kind of, it's making them feel dependent on that. And unless you link that particular channel, they're not going to get better. And it's kind of, you know, it's, I think it was Becky originally said back in the day, you know, she wants every single 
client to leave her clinic feeling more robust and happy about their body and that's kind of your goal you know which which you can't really do with certain narratives isn't it jamie gargett here um is asking a very common question um <laughs> it's what everyone wants it's like can i have the slides please hello all if you could link to one paper that sums up the clinical healthcare benefits of massage what would it be please right can you make me, you. can you make me full screen matt probably can well, i can make you a lot bigger maybe on let's have a look um, oh that'll do uh, so, uh, you'd have to drop the two of you out i suspect yeah right. why yeah. did you want to put something up yeah i did i want to put that up oh no i can make that hold on here we go okay that's what you need Jamie. talk through it uh can you remove my name uh, only because you're yes, covering up the um there you go wonderful so if anyone wants a screenshot of that it's a slide I've presented previously at things like Therapy Live, uh, and I pull it up actually uh, when talking with students, because quite often students will turn around and go, well, why are we giving massage then? <laughs> and, and for me, this sums it up with links to papers, um, is that, you know, we know that, for example, if we take non-specific lower back pain, which most of us will have come across in the clinic, single biggest risk factor uh, with the most significant dose response relationship the non-specific lower back pain is depression. The most evidence-based non-specific lower back pain treatment is pain education and exercise-based rehab. Significant barriers to patient compliance. Can we put it up in the Facebook group? <laughs> yeah, I can stick it in the Facebook group. I'll, I'll I was going to say, that'd be great. We'll make sure this slide's made it available now. It's in the public domain. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, significant barriers to patient compliance of that pain education and exercise-based rehab are anxiety and depression. Clinically significant benefits of massage are the reduction of anxiety and depression. Now, if you follow that link, um, which is actually, it's actually a book um, rather than a paper, Jamie. Um, but And it was published back in 2012. But it's um, by a guy called Christopher Moyer and Trisha Dryden. I think it's Trisha Dryden. Um, is a fantastic book. Back in 2012, they went through all of the literature around everything to do with massage uh, and they put it all into different chapters in the book um really really valuable even though it's you know nine years old now um it's a really valuable resource to to help you sum up those those clinical and healthcare benefits or understand the at least the evidence behind it so clinically significant benefits of massage reduction of anxiety and depression and because we are soft tissue therapists um this is this is obviously then a bit biased to that but saying what is a soft tissue therapy skill set massage which we know reduces anxiety and depression at which point we can then provide pain education and exercise based rehab and so that is why i'm still so passionate about the role that we have and the role that therapeutic touch has because i see it as an opportunity as, as does anna as does becky it is an opportunity to engage with someone who needs that contextual factor to progress in their journey of of well-being and recovery because actually just uh, to me fits so beautifully within the bps framework because actually, what do we do when we put our when we use massage with our clients? We de threaten, we de threaten fear, we de threaten a situation, we change, we reconceptualize what the client feel, and that to me is really powerful, much more than helping them to improve range of motion. To um, yeah, to quote uh, Greg Lehman, we calm shit down. And then mm -hmm. if we have the skill set, we build shit back up again. But fundamentally, massage is about calming it down. Yeah. Um, Dave uh, Polt has come back with a nice reply about the research, which is, which is quite poignant as well. No one needs what the average of all of us needs. It's kind of, I haven't heard that before. It's very true, though, isn't it? Yeah. No one likes yeah, to be called the average. <laughs> Yeah, no, nice one, Dave. Well, look, it's 9.05 now. I'm just scrolling down to check. Um, bah, 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 bah. Can this graphic? Yes, we will put it up in the Facebook. Great. I'll make sure it goes onto the Podbean notes as well with links to all of these as well. Right. Make sure that all goes in there if you guys send it to me. Hey, Dean. Um, hey, Dean I have, I, I'm really sorry if I've totally mashed up that name, Aideen. But um, anyone recommend a book or a course? Uh, yes, are you free this weekend? <laughs> um bit forward i know it's a little bit isn't it but um <laughs> claire Minchel, uh is teaching a two-day course on evidence-based rehabilitation um and and we're hosting her uh so if you are interested uh then and can get down to exmouth 
uh, then she's running a two-day course down there, uh, which will involve um, getting into the gym. We're, we're hosting it out of um, a CrossFit box, uh, and so it will involve lifting heavy things and learning why lifting heavy things is so important in rehab. Fantastic. Right, there you go. Um, very helpful. Thanks, Matt, for that. Okay, well, look, it's 9.05. Um, oh, it's gone back and forwards around uh, quite a few things now. This is this, The idea of this was to try and create some well i think we agreed beforehand it is it has been a positive year it hasn't come to an end yet but i think people more and more people are on the same page and thanks to people like yourselves massage collective you're helping be a fantastic conduit for that and put out this information without challenging people my final question to you would be um what recommendation would you give to therapists who are enlightened who are on the same page as you guys now and they want to help either younger or less enlightened therapists what part can they play now in helping disseminate the information without becoming part of the problem i, I have a little bit of a problem with it with the Easily. term enlightened uh, it, ju it just yeah no sorry matt it just shows a i don't know uh, I, I, yeah, I think it's enlightened i think it's a term that you know pe people people they need to learn that understanding has changed and that it should be absolutely part of their expectation to be a therapist. So coming back to your question is to um, provide that the colleague the new information and making framing those information like this is this is what we know now without saying, oh, you know, this is not how it would, how it is. No, this is what we know now. And for going forward, if you know any students, make them really comfortable and aware to be comfortable with change, with change in information. Because then we do not find any more those therapies having a backfire effect. If they know from day one that what I'm telling, what, evidence is showing us now it might be very different by the end that you finish the course so you know it's important that there, there is the expectation not to marry to an idea and i think that's very nice yeah, yeah be comfortable with change then that's really good and even what i'm telling you now could easily change because that's how we evolve especially yeah. with understanding humans i like it thank you Anne -Marie. that's great and i think you know i i am I'm probably I probably toe the line or toe an edge, uh, and and certainly a lot of my um, sort of collaborators do in terms of that being interpreted as tr disseminating information that is then taken poorly. Um, in in terms of uh, oh, we, you're just making me try. You're just trying to make other therapists feel crap. Um, and for me, I I wholeheartedly agree with 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 Anna's view and especially for therapists who would identify themselves as working with pain or injury, it has to be an expectation of yourself that you stay up to date. Like, like that's no one else's responsibility. And I don't think it's the responsibility of the therapists who post, you know, let's say contemporary information to, to handhold. Now that is different to putting this information across aggressively or putting this information across in such a way that deliberately makes someone feel bad about themselves. But what I would urge is for, is for therapists reading that kind of uh, thing and maybe feeling threatened or challenged or fearful is to, is to almost try and, try and acknowledge that feeling and ask the question why why do you feel challenged what is it about that post that feels challenged because you know what dissemination of knowledge is a two-way process teaching and learning have to take place and the and and the teacher and the learner need to be in a, in a little bit in the same kind of collaboration as therapist and client now we've already discussed or i've put forward my views on why social media is not a place to develop that kind of adult to adult relationship where teaching and, and, and learning kind of need that. So I think 
Social media posts need to be recognized for what they are. They are a dissemination of information into the ether. <laughs> um, and, and any kind of instinct to, to kind of be fearful of it or to respond in a negative way, I think needs to be explored. And you need to ask the question, why does this challenge me? And then perhaps there's more information that I need to gather before, you know, making my decision one way or another, because, you know, there's still a whole load of garbage out there that I react to very negatively. But I, good. I like it. We, I think we need to accept that these are two way streets and that, and that, you know, everyone has a responsibility, not just the original poster, but, but certainly those who respond to them as well. Nicely. Good point. Yeah. It's made me think that's good. Okay. Well, look, um, we've gone over time now, but um, yeah, anybody who's listening to the podcast, who's interested or maybe feels like, Oh, I have seen some things out there, which are a bit challenging and I'm a bit wired because I feel that I've wasted money on a certain course or I've been taught just yesterday that I was breaking down knots and improving circulation. And now you're saying it's not little things like that. Then my personal advice for the moment would be follow the massage collective. There you go. <laughs> Have a look at the uh, podcast, which they put out um, go back to the first one back in June, whenever it was to 2020 and just follow their journey through, listen to the guests they've got. I think you guys definitely, um, choose your guests according to getting that message out there calmly and well, most of them anyway i think getting that message out there calmly without um kind of too much cynicism and putting any punching down as people would say who criticized Jay, dave Chappelle. oh great great wasn't it? Oh, that was brilliant i enjoyed dave Chappelle. we won't get into that subject now i thought it was amazing i was standing up clapping but um <laughs> we won't get into that topic now bravo dave anyway we'll leave that for another day um but yeah no definitely follow the massage collective um and also you know follow us as well i'm just going to put us out there as well you've got 74 episodes including this now where the common theme has been come and learn with us we've all been there the older we look means the more we've been there and had to change our minds and kind of like evolve and realize that we're still here and practicing and probably better than we were 10 20 years ago because of it so um i hope that this session and these people have kind of shown you that that it's not a it's not a threat to your career it's just ways of becoming even better at what you already do that's all it is isn't it anyway guys we've got uh, we've got to go now but just a quick shout out therapy live you've got stuff um sorry therapy expo you've got stuff happening there haven't you 25th 26th what, how are you involved what's going on there so we're uh, going to be talking first at your conference it's true uh, at the sta yes, theater yeah thank yes, you very much for SDA joining theater. us on that so um, have... And we've got three other talks across the two days, I think, uh, in the various um, theatres. Uh, we're going to be on stand um, and talking about we uh, both the, the, the school and, and the Level 5 BTEC, but, but also Massage Collective. Um, we will have some merch. If anyone's interested in Massage Collective merch, you want to be part of the collective, come and see us. Uh, we'll have our podcasting equipment there as well. So um, we would love to hear from therapists. We want you to come up and, and it doesn't matter who you are, what you want to say, we want to hear from you and we'll, we'll be recording some stuff and that will go out uh, as a sort of um, a collective live podcast uh, after the fact. Uh, and I think we're chairing some um, some other discussions as well, although that's still uh, up in the air a little bit at the moment. So you'll so see you'll us. You'll definitely see us. <laughs> now I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be great. And if, if you're still looming and ahhing about whether to go to Therapy Expo this year on the 25th and 26th, then stop looming and ahhing. Um, unless you are particularly worried and there's consequences of mixing with people, which is the case for a lot of you, then mask up. Um, we're going to be talking in a couple of weeks to the... Um, head of learning and development for Therapy Expo is staging it all about security measures that are being taken with respect to COVID and bringing people together. So he's going to be on the show, which will be an interesting one. Look out for the um, adverts for that. But yeah, it's going to be great to see you guys um, and have a little elbow to elbow and just face to face. I'm looking forward to it. And there's some really good content this year, apart from the STA yeah. Theatre, because you guys are involved. I think it's a new year. I'm really excited yeah. about yeah. some of the conversations that are going to happen there. And some of the hopefully educated challenges to some of the traditional speakers they've still got there who are changing their tone. There's going to be a few of that as always. But yeah, it well, should be really good. So, you know, we're, we're looking forward again, it, it, trying to hear from therapists and be able to maybe influence further, few further years as well. And kind of, you know, ask the question, you know, Liam, who 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 must be the the chap you're having on is yes quite open Liam will come that, yeah. you know he's not a therapist um he needs guidance from us as therapists and so guys let's guide him let's, just let's, let's, yeah, let's what we want so communication that's what it's all about who would have thought the answer to life was communication <laughs> 
What a surprise that was. Right, gang, thanks so much. Um, Matt and Anna Maria, thank you so much for taking thank the time. You. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Really appreciate it as always. Um, if you want to follow um, Massage Collective, then Facebook is a pretty hot page to follow you guys, isn't it? You're on there a lot. And obviously Correct. via the podcast as well, which is available on all your favorite all platforms. Apps. There you go, all platforms. Um, next week, I'm not sure. We're trying to put something quite special together for next week. So um, watch out um, in STA member pages. Um, I'm going to be shouting out and asking a few of you to maybe contribute. So have a look. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for joining us live again. Um, and if you want to come and join us live rather than listen to the podcast, then it's Tuesdays, pretty much always eight o'clock UK time, either at the Facebook page for Sports Therapy Association, or if you prefer not to be part of Facebook, then join us on YouTube. And that's it. Matt, Anna Marie, thank you very much. Thank and you. We'll speak to you very soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. You're listening to the Sports Therapy Association podcast. Let's talk about it.